Well, welcome everyone to CG Seminar Strike Webinar number 355. We gradually inch towards the 400 mark, and that is by any definition a big score. Um, today we've got Kaho Mok and, uh, and Lucy Yu, who are going to talk to us about all factors in choosing higher education, a study abroad destination, as uh, choosing a higher education study abroad destination after the massive global immobility we've just experienced, a re-examination from Chinese perspectives. So Kahu continues to present to us the outcomes of his ongoing research on mobility in the region and that we really look forward to new revelations. And every time you do this, Kahu, I notice you get good media publicity. So there's a lot of interest in, in the work that's coming out of Lingnan now about uh, student mobility. Uh, now, it's a pleasure to introduce Kahu Mok, a valued colleague, um, member of the um, Centre for Global Higher Education's um, Management Committee, Research Management Committee, and a project leader. Um, he's also Vice President um, and concurrently Lam Man Sang Chair Professor of Comparative Policy at Lingnan University in China, which has made, I think, a, a formidable reputation for itself as a liberal arts university in the last few years. Not not entirely unrelated to Kaho's work as vice president. Um, now he's got a, an interest in global higher education and in the region. Um, he's got a long and impressive CV, which is you can read in our uh, in our website. But he's worked at University of Bristol. Um, he's been at uh, the um, you know the uh, uh, University of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, he's been at, um, I think you've been at the Education University, haven't you, Kaho? Yeah. 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 So all, all three institutions, he's made distinguished contributions. People still talk about his work in each of those places prior to his work at Lingnan. And he's accompanied today by um, Lucy Yu, who's um, Associate Professor in the School of Graduate Studies and Institute of Policy Studies at Lingnan. And her research focuses on intercultural communication Competence, second language acquisition, cross cultural psychology of international students. So at this point, let me take up no more time and hand over, I think, first to you, Kaho. Okay, thank you, Simon, for a very kind introduction. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, thanks for joining the uh, webinar series organized by uh, CG. Uh, it's our true honor to have my colleagues and I joining the webinar again to share with you about our ongoing project. I think uh, the world uh, is interested about the uh, student mobility uh, during the COVID uh, era. And also we are talking about in a post COVID environment. So this piece of presentation is based upon our recent publication co-authored uh, by uh, Li Han Guang and Lu Yi, uh, Lucy Yu and myself. And uh, for the time uh, control, I would like to uh, uh, just give a very broad, uh, uh, brief uh, introduction of the paper. This is a project, uh, you know, ongoing project, and then student mobility may change uh, based upon the different uh, time zone and also different uh, political context. But today uh, we just reported our recent finding January from our research proof surveys and also uh, some interview with parents. So without further ado, I will hand over to my colleagues, Lucy, to give you the detail and highlighting about the major findings, the research background of our piece and of our paper. Lucy. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mo, and thank you, Professor Magison, for introducing us. So uh, maybe I can share my screen. Yeah, good afternoon and good evening, because we are, I believe we have audience from Hong Kong as well, or from mainland China, and I see a lot of audience from uh, UK or maybe uh, the Western country. So uh, today, this this presentation is based on um, um, on the paper we published in uh, called Gender Education. So um, with another also author, Guan Nihan, as the first author of this paper. So in this um, uh, sharing in this seminar, I'm going to cover, we're going to cover four main um, aspects. So we're going to um, 
cover the uh, why the background and then introduce a little bit about the literature review and then specify our research objectives and followed by the methodology and findings and we will uh, discuss about it and then propose the implications. So for the introduction part, so for the introduction part, I'm going to cover the international education for Chinese and also the influence of COVID-19 and as well as the uh, New Year's policy facilitating international mobility from and to China. So um, actually Chinese people, um, Chinese, um, there is a very long history in international education for Chinese students. Um, it can be traced back to eight, 1842, the Qin Dynasty, uh, which can be featured by the Westernized movement in the quest of advanced knowledge. And um, in 1871, Yang Wing, uh, the first Chinese graduate from Yale University, persuaded the government to send 120 young students to study Western science and engineering in the USA. Um, and it was succeeded um, in um, 1872. Uh, I think that's the, the, the biggest, the largest amount of uh, Chinese um, scholars and students studying abroad. Then um, in 1972, with the reform and opening up policy, there is a booming demand for pursuing international knowledge for scaled human resources. So um, by 2019, before the COVID-19, there is still a very big demand on interdisciplinary talents um, for those international education. So actually, um, between 1972 and 2019, there are 6.5 Mm, million Chinese people obtained international degrees. So uh, you may ask who benefit from those international students' mobility? Um, what about those receiving destinations, uh, whether they benefit or not? So definitely they benefit or not. At the country level, um, research and data from research and data from statistics, I mean, some reports um, showed that net income gain was generated from international education industry. So uh, for US, um, they report $44 billion generated in um, 2019. Um, for Australia, um, there were $16 billion in 2012. And for UK, $14 million in 2012. Now what University also research have shown that um, there are some layoffs and budget deficiencies due to the insufficient tuition, full tuition paying international students. So um, actually I um, cite uh, Ma Jin Sen and Xu and Rindan's work by saying that the benefit of maintaining an adequate number of overseas students are critical for the economy of the universities and countries. Um, we all know the COVID-19 have changed many things. What about the effect or the influence of COVID-19 on the international education of Chinese students? Um, actually, yes, as we know, the COVID-19 caused the immobility due to, due to the global lockdowns at the peak of the pandemic and also frequent emergency flight fuses. For those inbound students, they were trapped in double bind, which means the ticket, uh, the L ticket for them to um, coming back, to come back to China is extremely, or was extremely expensive. Almost, um, there's a report of uh, one ticket from New York to China is about 25,000 US dollars per ticket, almost um, seven times of the normal price. And also it's 
even the price is very high, it's very hard for the students to get the ticket. Um, and for those students, actually, um, there's a very um, important study uh, done by Ling in 2020 showed that C line, C9 means uh, C9 League University means those top university in mainland China. So um, she in investigated in international as, uh, a Chinese students' intention to study abroad. And uh, it is found that their intention decreased from 24% uh, to um, almost 12%, almost decreased half of the intention. I think uh, the reason um, is easy to be guessed just because of lockdowns, um, inconvenience, so many, so much worries about everything. Luckily, um, those problems can be uh, tackled by the policy shifting. So the policy for re um, mobilization after the COVID-19. Uh, as we all know that China um, changed the policy from the zero tolerance to coexistence with COVID-19 virus in January 2023, this year. So with this policy shifting, so students, uh, Chinese students, they don't need to worry about the whether the flight availability or those quarantine uh, related inconvenience. So actually this policy shifting facilitates um, international mobility from and to China. And there are also some other aspects um, has, have been influenced, have been affected by COVID-19. Uh, for example, the higher education institutions. So the finance of the universities um, is heavily affected by the massive lockdowns and facility closure, declined international travel and shipping and global unemployment. And as we know, um, because of the lockdown, the campus, so there are also some uh, changes in the pedagogical measures. Uh, such as we change the teaching of almost all of all of all of the world. We have to change from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching. We have to try to find some virtual classroom for our classmates, for our students. So students um, won't think this is the real studying abroad. So all these um, changes maybe lead students to uh, seek for multiple destinations when they apply, when they are thinking about whether they need to go to uh, study. So they want to um, have many offers at hand and make a final decision. Maybe they will just, uh, they actually observe closely on those policy changes during the COVID-19. Um, this research is actually situated in a pool and the push model of studying abroad. Um, and when we talk about push factors, so we are referring to the social, political, and economic development in students' home countries that motivate them to pursue education abroad. The pool of factors, that means those elements, those factors that attract students to select one destination over others. So in this case, the students we surveyed is more about they um, are willing, they are not pushed by some social or political or economic development. So they actually choose by themselves. So um, push factors um, are not that relevant. So uh, we only look at poor factors. Uh, what are the major poor factors um, that attract those international students? Chinese international students to study abroad, to choose their destination. Uh, after reviewing a few, a comprehensive reviewing uh, the literature, so uh, we conclude there are six poor factors that are very important for Chinese students to make their decision. Um, they are the reputations and locations of institutions and the employment and uh, immigration opportunities, the economic development of destination, and the recommendations from family and friends, language in use, and course of overseas experience. Um, however, 
Um, even we know these six factors may still remain very important. Um, the identified poor factors um, may be insufficient to understand those students um, during the pandemic. Um, so um, actually, um, there are some research already pointed out um, there is one reason, there's one difference um, that emerged regarding the choice of the study destination relates to the application process. So Chinese students now have a strong tendency to apply to multiple destinations I just mentioned in the previous slides. So this research actually focuses on two objectives. So one is to re-examine the influence of COVID-19 on the poor factors that help Chinese full uh, tuition paying international students to decide on institution destination. Whether those um, factors we identified still remain as very important. Another important perspective is we're going to investigate the similarities and the differences in evaluating poor factors between Chinese students and parents. So the method, so as we uh, have identified six dimensions of poor factors, and we try to um, come up and to uh, come up with more sub factors under each. And um, this uh, survey um, was designed on the seven point Likert scale from one meaning the least important, seven meaning the most important. The data was connected between November uh, 2022 and January 2023. So um, the sample, we, uh, we got 1,335 um, and through three different channels. The first one, online survey platform, very little. And I think study abroad agency help a lot. And also uh, we um, seek help from the higher education institutions, global cooperation programs. So we got another bunch of responses on um, this survey. So we did some analysis. Um, let me first um, introduce the background of those participants. Um, 70, 97 uh, responses were, recruit, uh, were exclude, excluded because of the missing data. So in the end, we have uh, more than 1,000 um, students' responses and 184 responses from parents. So among the students, um, we have more bachelors, uh, no, sorry, the majority is a master. Okay, you can see master here, um, over 5,000, and nearly 400 are, are going to pursue their bachelors, and the 91 expressed their intention to pursue doctor studies. Um, and there are more females than, uh, than males, and for the parents' response, so the parents, um, those parents uh, express um, their children are going to pursue bachelors. Um, as a majority of them are, are those um, bachelor students' parents, and some of them are master. But the um, PhD or the doctor, they not almost no parents. Um, express or told us that they are the parents of those doctor students because normally doctor students are more in independent, more mature, and they don't um, they they pursue their study by their own uh, needs or motivation or plan. So uh, normally the parents may not involve uh, in the doctor study um, their choice of destination uh, destination of doctor study. So um, here's the uh, first major analysis of the poor factors for students. Um, you can see um, if we look at um, the percentage, uh, those percentage over 50, so we can see tuition cost, living cost, tuition language, and Chinese employment uh, prospects stand out as the most important poor factors for students. This is another chart, the same data. 
And there are also some other important ones, such as economic development of host country, ranking of the majors, ranking of institutions, and the daily language. Uh, they also read, read, they also think this is a very important uh, factor. But the most important are those in uh, the uh, it, uh, uh, those are uh, uh, in the first uh, four, ranked as number four. So I just, uh, this is by descending ratio. So for the uh, parents um, of those international students, um, you can see if we cart is a 50 as the um, most important, we have five. So I highlight word ranking of the institutions comes up by the rating of the parents. And two others are also important, recommendation of others and economic development of a host country. That means uh, for Chinese students and parents, they would value whether that, that the destination country is more advanced in terms of the uh, economic development than China. We also did the uh, t-test um, to check the differences or similarities in rating the factors between students and parents. Um, the finding is quite interesting. So from this table, we look at the means. If the means is above four, that means they uh, can uh, kind of um, agree. So that means they think these are important. So uh, the, both parents and the students, they think these four are really important Chinese employment prospects. Okay, and I think it's not very surprising for tuition fee living costs and tuition language, but this one is quite interesting. And I want to draw your attention to another P. If the P uh, is larger than 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.01, that means um, parents and students, they rate, rate the, on the item Similarly, no difference between them. You look at the, the, um, the score, they are very similar to each other. That means they all agree this is important and tuition language is important. And they think the word ranking of the institution is not that important. Um, I mean, by, by uh, if we check the, the mean number, the mean three, three, I think uh, we have seven point. So the seven point, that means the number four is in the, in, in the middle, um, then that means neutral. So if, if below number four, uh, seems that the both parents students rated this not that high. Um, but I want to draw your attention to those uh, in, I circled with the, I use a square to, uh, in the red. So you can see the difference between the parents rating and students rating. Parents rate, rate uh, knowledge of host city, knowledge of host institution and economic development host very high, while students rate it very low um, um, this free including recommendations of others. Parents, they would like to listen to others and they would like to seek more information from others, including the relative friends, I think as well as the agents as well. Um, so um, you can see the difference and the similarities. I, I will draw, I will, um, Draw a um, major I mean, the major finding. I will summarize the major finding. Well, uh, I try to uh, we try to discuss um, the findings and the implications. So here's the um, uh, if we put it as kind of a uh, rank rank, we can see uh, this. We can see a big. Um, oh, it's easy for us to see the difference and the similarities about here. I think the first three um, are almost the same, but from number four, so students rated uh, Chinese. That means they have employment opportunities in China, very high. Uh, well, parents will look at whether the institute is, um, is in the, uh, um, the league table or is in the world ranking, whether it's ranked very high. 
And this also uh, was valued by students, but was ranked as number five. And this uh, number five, number four is reversed, uh, but also important. And the other one um, emerged in parents' rating is about recommendation. Uh, well, also um, students also think the ranking of the institution are very important, uh, but compared to the other five, uh, this is ranked as number six. So what are the critical factors shared in both groups? Um, in fact, both parents and the students, they resemble in the poor factors, they favor elite education. That means um, whether the major is ranked very, or is well-known and is a, a well-established program or the university, well, it is very well-known or also they will refer to the ranking as well. So, and whether the price is affordable, so they will look at the tuition and the living, uh, et cetera, whether they can find a job when they finish the, uh, the um, education, they can find a job in China. This emerge as a very interesting finding. So uh, the subject institution rankings are still effective for successful employment. They are uh, later I will um, discuss and also tell um, uh, what are the implications for these findings. So some factors are no longer um, considered important, such as the employment prospects of the destination. I think this was found very, very important for students, especially for Chinese students uh, studying abroad um, 10 years or 20 years ago. And the number two immigration opportunities also was found very important, but not important in this study. And the recommendation of friends and family was very important before, but not that important in this study. But maybe you will ask why not important because Actually, uh, if we study the number of students returning to China, uh, we can see uh, the tendency is increasing. More and more Chinese international students uh, choose to return back to China, um, especially uh, from uh, 2019 to 2021. Um, I guess the uh, rationale between, behind this, um, one is because of family reason, the other is because of their job market in many China is um, they think they can find a job or they can have their own business. So uh, number two um, is also because of the um, poly, uh, political reasons. Um, as we know, the, uh, the international relationship between China and the, the allies um, of those countries uh, with U.S. have led to a new Cold War and, um, and other major West, Western powers. So I think for the Chinese parents and Chinese students, they may worry about um, their safety issue. So if they they went, do, went to those countries, uh, whether they will be treated equally or whether they will be discriminated. So I think this will cause some worries among the students and also the uh, parents. And the third one is about the, it's related to the culture of China. So as we know, um, China is a very typical patriarchal uh, society. And also we have implemented one child policy since 1979. That means it's only one child. This one child, the family want them to come back and then uh, the parents getting are getting old, um, not like before. Um, so they have they have more than one child. So of course, one child can stay in US, another child can um, work in mainland China, take care of the uh, parents or the parents also. On the other hand, uh, as we know, the economy of uh, China um, has, I think, in recent 10 years um, uh, is quite good. So that means uh, either they can look for jobs uh, in, in, in some organizations in universities, or they can have their own business. 
So that's why uh, that's that's reasonable. That's uh, consistent with why uh, there are more and more Chinese international students coming back to China. So uh, there might be some. There also. There are some differences in parents and students' priorities in their rating. So for example, students rated uh, the employment in China and the daily language uh, a bit high. Um, I think because they, they, they know that um, when they return, uh, they, they, they focus more on the return. Uh, from a return on the investment perspective, they see English as an opportunity for global communication and employment because they, uh, they still see the value of speaking English or using the language. If they can speak very good English, using English as, very, as their communication um, uh, language. So it, it is very possible for them to find a good job in mainland China, in international company. So um, they, that's why they will pay, they, they actually value the daily language as well, uh, very high. So for the parents, um, they value the tuition cost, the knowledge of the host, knowledge of the host institution and city, and also the recommendation of others um, because uh, the parents, are more um, fixated on the cost, something that may be related to the negative effects. And I think that is reasonable because uh, studying abroad uh, for a one child for one year actually can um, cost a lot for a normal family in mainland China. But you know, uh, uh, in China, parents, all the family value the education of the child. They will even sell their house to support their children um, to study abroad. So, uh, of course, so that's why uh, this is always the very important factor um, that parents need to uh, put into consideration. Another one, why they uh, want to know more about the city, more about the institutions. Uh, this can be interpreted because parents now are having more involvement with children's education choices. Um, because uh, China is a Confucius heritage and Manchus heritage country, or oh, basically we call Confucius heritage country. Um, that means, um, um, in our value, uh, if possible, um, um, it, it is important who will who is the who has more say in a family is more about the parents. And of course, the parents, I, I, I still remember I talked to um, a mother um, in Hong Kong, and she's from mainland China. And she told me she would never send her child, her daughter. Uh, to study to, to abroad because she said if she married uh, in a foreign country and that means you will, you will lose a daughter and that's her um, perception and value she said uh, um, she heard a lot of stories about that so daughter married a westerner in Australia and parents went there to visit them um, and they even um, came out uh, live together with the children and um, the, the daughter and the, the son in all just uh, um, pay um, pay uh, the hotel and ask them to stay in the hotel. So for the Chinese parents, they'll feel very sad um, about it because the parents and children have very close connection with each other. And the other one, uh, this one I have uh, discussed. And uh, so um, I, I think this can show later uh, if we look at the destination. So the destination are mainly from those um, very, um, I mean, develop the um, develop the country, uh, especially in an uh, economy. So um, here there are some recommendations for the institutions. Um, for example, the method for more full tuition paying. So I mean, actually, the university should consider give some financial aids or scholarship. May not be a uh, full scholarship some financial aids uh, for those full tuition paying international students uh, because um, 
they value the, the, the they all will say whether they, um, how much they will cost, how much they will invest, how much um, they will, um, they can get a return. And the other thing is about uh, return. Yeah, that's uh, what I want to discuss on the second point. So uh, students will pay attention to their investments, uh, parents as well. Um, so, so as we as we just mentioned that whether they can get a job upon graduation is really important. So for the um, in terms of marketing strategies. I think the uh, university can work very closely with agents, agencies to advertise the figure like their employment rate, like the average salary of their graduates, um, like the career, uh, the Chinese career paths of institutions alumni. And also, I think the university, if they want to have more Chinese international students, they should study what are those um, talents that are needed in, um, by China, but of course there might be some other consideration. Um, so um, before it is the university, they attract our Chinese students and they don't pay much attention to the major, but I think the major, I mean the program itself uh, should be well designed um, based on the needs of uh, those students. So the implications for future studies, I think in the future, um, future research can uh, rethink about the design. So they maybe think about qualitative data, connect qualitative data to know more about the reasons um, behind their, their rating. And they can get data, compare the students with the parents. I mean, you get students and then you got the parents' response and they can correspond to each other to see whether they are very they are more consistent or the more variable uh, to each other. And if they are not consistent to each other, and we would like to know the final decision was made by who, that would be very interesting. And the other um, suggestion is the uh, research scale. So because this study uh, was mainly, the data was mainly uh, from one province in China. So I think uh, countrywide, I mean, different provinces, different universities can involve more universities across the country um, would be also very interesting. And if we can get data from different countries and to do comparison, I think the finding would be more meaningful. But also, as I mentioned, not just studying about the, the rating of the destination or about, or about the poor factor, we also ask them to tell us why. Um, that will be uh, even more meaningful and interesting. So um, that's the suggestion from this research. So here are the references. Thank you. I think um, Professor Mo and, uh, and, and I are waiting for um, some questions. Yeah, so some. shall I stop some. sharing? Yeah, yeah, stop sharing, please. please. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, well, questions are coming in now. Um, and you've certainly provoked a lot of interest. I think the, you know, also some comments in the chat as well about the data. Um, Lucia, can I ask a couple of things? Just a comment too. I mean, it's really interesting to see how immigration just doesn't figure in the, you know, in the thinking and prior mm. to study. Uh, I mean, my experience of international education is that it tends to arise as a possibility during study uh, rather than prior. I mean, there are exceptions to this. And students from South Asia often have a migration plan and, uh, and are pitching their their, their international education trajectories in relation to the possibility of migration. Uh, but that's not usually the case in most other parts of the world. Um, and and but, but the idea does come up for people when they've been living in the country of education for a couple of years, you know, that, that, that then they begin to think about it. And so and it does happen. And there is quite a strong relationship between immigration patterns and international education activity. In the case of some countries like Australia, a third of the uh, the students end up um, staying in Australia for a considerable time, if not permanently, after graduation. So the factor is quite important. Um, but it doesn't show in, as initial preference at all. 
Um, and interesting also that daily language is not really important. People think in terms of language of instruction, which is understandable because it's an educational activity that we're talking about. But actually, daily language is the thing which you learn from more than anything, I think, in terms of fluency, especially obviously spoken, listening and speaking. Um, you know, you learn that by immersion in the in the country of uh, of that language uh, effectively. Um, but people don't realise that again until they go through the process and you know and, and engage. Um, the uh, employment prospects in the country of education not being important too. That's interesting. I think that. Um, Again, South Asia would show a different pattern where often um, you know, the financing is different. Uh, in the case of Chinese families, there's usually family savings. There's a commitment, a forward plan, a sense of, of capacity that it's doable, at least in terms of tuition, often in terms of living costs. And But in South Asia, there's an assumption that money will be raised during the process and often also um, an assumption that money will be earned after um, education at the postgraduate work stage to pay for the cost of education so you get a different so questions of employment prospects unemployment rates and so on do figure more for south asia than for east asia um my question is about agents um are agents playing a role in this tendency now to go for multiple destinations i think that's really interesting um and it's kind of in a way keeping the choice open for longer uh, mm -hmm. i wonder if agents are playing a role in that and the other thing I wanted to ask about was safety. Um, you know, the, the safety in the country of, of um, education. Did that, that didn't come up as a, as a criterion, I think, in this study. I wondered why it was not um, explored, because that might be a factor. Hmm. Uh, maybe I can recall the agency, uh, such as multiple destinations. Uh, um, so, um, I think it's just because, um, um, you know, the pandemic, um, there are so many uncertainties. So uh, students, they do have a plan uh, to go abroad. And then in order to secure one and to watch the different policies in different countries. So that's why um, they would like apply for a different kind of uh, um more, I mean, they will have the, their own list of their favorite universities in different countries to make sure they want to go. I know there are many, many um, uh, students, many students, they just uh, receive the offer. They have to defer it uh, to wait until the pandemic or the, the situation of pandemic is clear. Um, you. Thank you for asking the second the question about the safety, whether they will worry. Yeah, yeah that's why actually we uh, when we designed this survey, we basically based on the existing um, existing questionnaire to compile them to combine them together. Um, but we are uh, because because that was very that was lacking. So, but during the talk, during the uh, the uh, I didn't um to re I didn't report the finding from the uh the re uh, interview uh from the parents. So of course the parents they worry a lot worry a lot about the safety issue. Um. I, I also remember uh, we discussed about this and some parents just say, no, I don't think education, everything, nothing is very important. The uh, living, I mean, the life of my son, of my daughter is really important. So the parents try every way to um, buy the tickets for their children and help them come back to mainland China. And also the changes about that is some students, they, they um, come back to mainland China and they started the online learning or they switch from one program to program in mainland China. That means the collaboration between mainland China University and a foreign university, those kind of university become very, very popular for those, uh, for some students during the COVID-19. Um, Yes, but I think your suggestion is really important for the safety issue. Um, and I think in uh, um, Professor Moore's another, I mean, in, in our uh, other project, we also rated this um, as a sur survey, big survey, right? Maybe Professor Moore, uh, do you have something to complement? 
Yes, yeah, Simon, thank you for raising the issue because in uh, our team's another survey, uh, uh, it did uh, highlight about uh, two major considerations when uh, students were asked about when planning ahead for overseas learning. One is about personal safety. Another is about the health uh, uh, security, uh, especially during the time when we conducted the survey uh, during the big wave of uh, COVID infection. And uh, the current uh, survey presented to you just now highlighted about uh, both parents and students. They have taken children course and also living course as the uh, top uh, uh, factors when conceiving the plan for overseas learning. I, I, I just want to uh, contextualize about this because Chinese parents, uh, they many of them are also affected by the COVID uh, era because of the domestic, regional, and also global economy has been uh, truly affected. And so that's why they have to take into the financial uh, cap capacity into consideration. Another factor uh, which uh, hasn't been uh, uh, prominent is about immigration. I think it's well related to the issue that Simon, you may predict, because uh, parents and, and students may think that because of the geopolitics, has affected the relations between China and their allies. And certainly uh, in the old days, they certainly think about, you know, overseas may lend them into potential migration opportunity and then get a job elsewhere. But now our survey this time being highlighted about the student uh, being asked, they take uh, employment back home, more, you know, important than overseas. I think we, we have to take into this broader political economy when conceiving and analyzing student mobility, especially in the uh, when we face a lot of immobility before, and we had and we conducted this one in a more relaxed, uh, broader, open uh, con uh, context. So it's a quick response to your question. Thank you. Yeah, that all makes perfect sense. Um, now let's bring in Vincenzo Ramo, who's got a, an interesting question in the chat. So that, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I think it was a great presentation and really timely, especially for us here in the UK, where much of the debate about international students relates to immigration. So I, I was struck by two things in particular in the presentation. And Simon's mentioned these already, you know, the cost of study abroad options being key, but also the lack of importance in employment and immigration opportunities in the host country. So, so my question really concerns the pathway students use to international study, whether they are more likely or less likely to go direct to the overseas institution for their study, to go via, or to go via a partnership program in China, which reduces the need and therefore the cost of obtaining a foreign degree, or will they increasingly complete foreign degrees entirely in China. So, so well, I think pathway. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I think uh, this is uh, a very uh, interesting and important question. But in our survey, we didn't ask uh, that sort of question directly. But as I respond to you, I don't think we have a, a scientific data in front of us to give you a concrete answer. But certainly, I think students in China have more choices. As you, uh, what you just mentioned, uh, major Chinese universities, some of them are able to turn some of the learning into more internationalization experience on campus. This is one alternative. Another one is about the joint program or transnational program uh, based in China, mainland, like uh, Shanghai. Uh, you know, New York University, Duke Quinsan, Nottingham, Ningbo, all these all are another alternative for students try to look for diversifying learning experience. The third would be going overseas uh, for learning. But I think uh, uh, there would be more choices for students. They have to calculate about the course and also the potential opportunity. And more importantly, what sort of you know, learning experience would land them in the job market? Because now China uh, itself, uh, in terms of an institution are able to produce over 10 million graduates a year. And they also offer different form of learning experience, but very much I think the uh, individual and family would calculate about uh, the cost and investment and what's then uh, the opportunity cost at the end. But certainly I, we also observed some interesting finding uh, in the last couple of years, as Chinese students' interest to overseas learning still remain high. But their destination may not be going to the U.S. Uh, as traditionally be the case, or they may think about uh, Asia, like Singapore and Hong Kong, as a, 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 an alternative. 
a lot to say about the translational program being highlighted by your good self. So uh, whether there's a pathway, we don't know about uh, the uh, definite pathway, but I can uh, come to the conclusion that we can see about the diverse trends uh, emerging when talking about uh, student mobility from China. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Professor Mo. Actually, I want to add one more thing. Uh, because the data was connected during the COVID-19, so the rating will be largely influenced by the COVID-19. So I think the psychology of the uh, parents and the students, they rate just because of their worry. And then so that's why if we do uh, the survey again, after the COVID-19, I think the employability uh, in a foreign country may also be rated very high. So it is very possible. Um, in terms of the studying abroad, I, I think um, now the, um, I was told actually, we are also um, um, running the program for recruiting um, foreign students, international students, including um, students from mainland China. I found there's big market for those students to study either choose Hong Kong and also as well as UK. I think it's a very popular destination for those mainland uh, students to or Chinese students to choose. So uh, actually they, because right now it's very, very highly com competitive for them to secure a job upon graduate um, when they obtain um, a bachelor degree. So almost all, I think I, I, I didn't do uh, the, I mean, this by estimate, I think maybe uh, there are some colleagues here uh, who knows the market. I think 80%, even 90% of them um, will try to find or pursue their master studies either in mainland China or if it's affordable, uh, of course, they, uh, if their English is good, so they have more choices. So it can be um, English speaking countries and then can also be Hong Kong. Mm. Well, thanks both. And thanks Vincenzo for provoking that interesting discussion. Um, Ellen, Ellen Wang is next. Ellen, can you come in please? Good, there she is. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Professor Yu for, for the very insightful presentation. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, obviously myself, I'm coming from a, a Chinese background as well. So I've got a one part question and then the other part is more of observation. So my question is, I'm very intrigued in your data collection process in terms of the port factor for decision making for both the students and uh, parents. Now, we all know China as a country has very rich regional cultures or subcultures, shall I say. Um, so I'm just interested in your decision making in terms of how um, you've collected or made a decision to invite certain groups of students and parents from different parts uh, of China. Um, because obviously my understanding is their mentality can be very different in terms of how they perceive international higher education and also making decision when it comes to sending their kids to um, study abroad and a decision on which country to select and the important factors to them. So I think I'm just interested in how your decision making comes in um, and how is proportion or what is the proportion like uh, to represent certain voices from different parts um, in China? Uh, so that's my, my first part of the question. And then the second observation is again, relating to your data collection um, and the, the decision. Obviously you're, you mentioned yourself that the data is collected during the pandemic period. So I'm very interested to see that the, um, technology side of things hasn't come into play at all um, because obviously as we know right at the peak of the pandemic um, there were a lot of the digital transformation for a lot of international for higher education higher education institutions um, and therefore there were lots of online teaching hybrid teaching um, etc etc so why do you think that elements hasn't come into their decision making. So thank you very much. That's my question. Thank you, Alan, for your questions. Uh, that's very interesting. Actually, um, I didn't say uh, very specifically, the location of the data connection is from Shandong province. So that's why um, in the end, I um, 
propose that more data from more provinces and uh, if we can across the country, that will be more representative. And but the one more thing I want to highlight about the location of Shandong province. So we have a big, big sample size by uh, um, convenient sampling, uh, already have a big one. So, um, and one feature of the Shandong province is uh, deeply, I mean, the Confucius culture is deeply rooted in Sandong province. So that's why uh, in, in my discussion, when I mentioned about the patriarchal and also the family relationship, and that why uh, the, uh, the parents' opinion are really important. So uh, this is one, one of the feature. Um, another feature I want to say uh, about, you mentioned us as well, the agency. So because, the agency, they have the most recent data from those students who want to go abroad to study. So that's why uh, the agent and also the uh, um, um, the other, uh, it, I mean, the, a majority of the data come from the agency. So um, I think this data can only represent uh, those students have intention or have prepared to go abroad during pandemic um, of those uh, students, I mean, in the Sandong province can, because it's, it's random sampling and sample size, a majority of them are coming from the agency and they, they must have some connection with the agency. They must uh, inquire or do some applications through the agency so that it's easy for the agency to get this data. Um, so I think, as, as to the representation, we can represent those students. We cannot say it can represent, yeah, you are right, cannot represent uh, the whole population across different um, cities, universities, and, and also across the country. Um, another interesting question about digital transformation. Um, yes, that is important. I think one thing I can talk about is more about the, um, is, it, the uh, directly related to their destination choices is about the pedagogical um, uh, practices. So online teaching, whether those students think this will be effective. I think most of the students don't think this is real studying abroad. And as we know that the, um, the recognition, uh, I mean, the uh, Education Bureau, uh, Education, I, I mean, the Ministry of Education, they may not recognize those students without face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and learning experience uh, in abroad, but during pandemic, they give special approval, but after uh, pandemic, they won't. So that means they are encouraging um, the real studying abroad for those students. Um, I think your suggestion are really important, um, could be incorporated and considered in our future um, design and study. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and thanks, Alan. I think you almost became our third speaker there. That was a terrific um, contribution to the to the webinar. Um, well, well, having said that, uh, we have time for um, uh, another question. I'm afraid we don't. Um, that last exchange was very good, and and it took up the rest of our time. So, can I just invite Carho perhaps to say a final word before I uh, give you next week uh, next uh, webinar? Okay, thank you very much, Simon, and thank you, my colleagues, for presenting the, our ongoing research. I think the issue about student mobility is an interesting one. Uh, we will go on uh, and tracking about uh, the studies, especially during the more stabilized uh, health uh, conditions, to see whether the issue being discussed today uh, would be uh, coming out with different uh, uh, observations in future. Uh, we look forward to having more conferences in the future uh, for the CG webinar. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Kaho. And look, thanks, Lucy. I think the, day, the data today were terrific. And uh, but not only that, your discussion uh, in response to the questions was really helpful, really, really effective. So this is one of the best webinars we've had in the Future of Academic Mobility series, I think. And I really sincerely thank both of you for the way you've uh, made your, the data so clear and accessible. And we've had very positive comments coming through in the chat about the webinar. So we look forward to seeing you both again in future at, an, at a future CG webinar. Um, next in our um, Future of Academic Mobility series is the uh, um, Australia's superstar of international education research, Lee Tran, who will be accompanied by Diep Nguyen um, for the first time on the CG webinar. 
and they'll be talking about international student engagement and support. Uh, that webinar will be next Tuesday, UK time, two o'clock to three o'clock. We really look forward to seeing you then. Uh, thanks to Mary for who facilitates our webinars. Thank you all for coming. Um, such a good um, take up from the initial registrations, Coho. We had, I think, about 55% of people, which is much higher than we usually get, which showed the interest in this webinar. So thank you both again. And thank you. to everyone, it's bye for now. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.